So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of CEC 17, and the first day that'll be structured around sessions. What we see here is the ground we'd like to cover in the next 90 minutes, and as you can tell, it's a rather densely populated list of items, so I'd like to get right to it. My name is Stefan Schäfer. Uh, I had the pleasure of chairing the steering committee for CEC 17, which is a wonderful group of people that put together a framework for the conference which you can see on the next slide. Here we go. Uh, so this is basically the logic of the conference, uh, this, the structure that we've developed. And I'd like to start us out with a very high-level overview of, of this structure of the conference program. So the program is composed of parallel sessions, of which there will always be four, and plenaries. Uh, the, the conference will be taking place in two buildings. So. This is uh, the building in which we'll be hosting all of the plenaries and always one of the sessions. And then there's the building next door, which is the Neue Melzerei, where we'll be hosting two sessions on the fifth floor and one session on the ground floor. And there should be a map, here's a map, of where we are in the Umweltforum, the bottom right, and then the Neue Melzerei right next to us. The path for getting there is slightly different from what's indicated in your program because there's some construction going on. So they've closed off the main path. You'll have to walk up to the street and then take a right uh, to get to that building. So uh, plenaries will always be taking place here. Uh, parallel sessions, as I said, one will be also here always in this uh, plenary hall. Uh, two on the fifth floor of the Neue Melzerei and one on the ground floor of that building. Tonight's panel discussion, which we have here in green, will be taking place at the uh, Haus der Kultur und der Welt, the House of World Cultures, or HKW for short, uh, which is one of our conference partners for CEC 17. And we'll have shuttles leaving to the House of World Cultures from in front of both buildings. So in front of this building and in front of the Neue Melzerei at a quarter to six tonight. And we should have those locations here. So that's where the buses are going to be leaving. You'll be leaving on time, so please make sure that the final sessions this afternoon, if you're hosting one of those sessions, also end on time so that everyone can make their way to the shuttles. And then for guests who stay at the Park Inn, we have organized shuttles from the House of World Cultures back to the Park Inn at 10 and at 11 tonight after the conference dinner, which will take place in the House of World Cultures restaurant, uh, the Alsta, which is in the same building as the House of World Cultures, uh, and is open to those who have registered for it. So please make sure to take your name tag with you to the conference dinner, as that indicates uh, that you're eligible for the, for the dinner. Uh, cash payment on the day is unfortunately not possible. Uh, we'll also be having a group photo uh, tomorrow, uh, which we'll be taking outside if the weather permits, uh, behind the tent and in the garden. Uh, if the weather doesn't, uh, then we'll take it here in the plenary hall. But we'll make another announcement about this through the speaker system when the time comes. Uh, we have reserved one extra room in the other building, in the Neue uh, Melzerei, for spontaneous ad hoc sessions uh, for people to organize get-togethers on topics they consider relevant for further discussion, uh, which is the Kuppelsaal Nord. It's also on the fifth floor of the Neue Melzerei as two of the session rooms. And there's a sign-up sheet for those wishing to organize such a spontaneous session on a pin board in the foyer of this building. Now, for two of the upcoming events, for, for one session and one plenary, uh, we've received some preparatory material, which we've posted online on the CEC 17 website. It would be great if you could have a look at that before those sessions. So for one, for the SRM Governance World Cafe plenary, which will be taking place tomorrow from 4.30 to 6.00, uh, Ted Parson, who will be hosting this event, has prepared five short scenarios. So please read them in advance of the event and uh, come prepared in that sense. Uh, and then for the parallel session on the Code of Conduct for Geoengineering Research, which Anna Maria Hubert is organizing, uh, and which will be taking place on Thursday from 2 to 3.30 p.m., there's a new version of the Code of Conduct online, so please also have a look at this document if you're planning to participate in this session. Now, a couple of rules of procedure. Uh, we've decided to apply the Chatham House rule in sessions. So that means that participants are free to use the information received in those sessions. But neither the identity nor the affiliation of the speaker or speakers may be revealed without their explicit consent. 
Now, this does not apply to the plenary sessions. We're also working together with a film crew to film the plenaries and to produce a conference film. Uh, there's a couple of accredited film crews doing filming as well, but no filming is allowed in the sessions, in the individual parallel sessions. Now, many of you might be aware that we had very high levels of interest in the conference, uh, to the extent that we unfortunately had to reject a not insignificant number of applications. Uh, but to be able to allow as many people in as possible, we've pushed the limits of what's possible within this venue and uh, so that individual sessions might end up being uh, rather full. Now, one response to that has been that we've decided to host sessions in this plenary hall as well. So there'll always be one session in this room, which is large enough to fit everyone who uh, might not happen to find a place in another session that they were hoping to participate in. And we do also have security at the venues. So please wear your name tags visibly also at these venues at all times to identify yourself as a conference participant. Now a couple of logistics, Wi-Fi, there's internet access. Uh, you'll see the code on the, uh, the access code on page 32 in your conference program. There's also signs in the conference rooms that give you the code. Uh, coffee is served in both buildings. So here, coffee breaks will be both here and in the Neue Melzerei. Lunches will be served only here in the Umweltforum in the main foyer and in the galleries up here, which is also where we're hosting the poster session on Wednesday night. Uh, posters are set up already, so feel free to have a look at those. Now, unfortunately, all the directions in the buildings are in German, but we hope that, of course, our German-speaking colleagues will be kind enough to help those who do not master that language to find their way around. Now, a group of us is carrying out a conference survey, which is led by Masa Sugiyama, and survey links were sent out to all participants yesterday and should be in everyone's inboxes. Thank you very much to those of you who have already responded. We've got a quite high response rate already. Uh, but please be sure to uh, complete the survey at your earliest convenience if you haven't done so yet, as the organizers of the final plenary uh, are looking to present some of the survey results there and use them as a basis for discussion. Uh, now, the survey will be open until midnight tonight. Uh, and if you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at this email address. There's also going to be a post-conference survey, which we'll send out next week, but that's a separate endeavor. There's also a participant feedback form available on the conference website, which we'd be really very grateful if you could fill out so that we can integrate your feedback into hopefully making the next event that we host an even better conference experience for you. And uh, then a last announcement on that. There's a, uh, there are two items on display in the galleries that I'd like to particularly point out. So we have uh, an item that the uh, Red Cross contributed to the conference, a virtual reality simulator that visual visualizes Arctic sea ice, which is coming, I believe, on Wednesday, and a simulator for policymakers by Climate Interactive. So please go and try them out in the breaks or whenever you find time. There's also a lounge set up in one of the rooms in the other building, uh, in the Kuppelsaal Süd, uh, on the fifth floor of the Neue Melzerei, which is open throughout the conference, and you can uh, hang out there for informal meetings, or for working, or just for relaxing. And finally, there is a conference Twitter hashtag, which is this. And uh, with that, I'd like to move us into the presentation part of this plenary, starting with uh, a talk by Nem Vaughan and an update on carbon dioxide removal. Nem is a lecturer at the Tyndall Center for Climate Change Research in the School of Environmental Sciences at the University of East Anglia, and she's also a member of the CEC 17 Steering Committee. Nem. Okay, good morning everybody. I've been asked um, as part of the Steering Committee to give people just a, a brief overview of where we're at in terms of carbon dioxide removal. Um, the focus of this talk is um, kind of uh, context and the advancements since uh, 2014, the previous CEC conference. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Phil Renforth from Cardiff University who helped contribute the slides on enhanced weathering in this talk. 
So what I also want to do, I think one of the crucial things that's moved forward is that there's been a shift in the context, which I'll go into. Um, I'll briefly go over what is carbon dioxide removal um, and highlight a couple of recent developments. It is skewed towards my interests, um, and so I am not being exhaustive or covering every possible thing. Um, for that, please come and participate in some of the sessions. So when I summarise at the end, I will also, on my last slide, highlight some of the sessions that may be of interest um, to those of you who are interested in carbon dioxide removal methods. Um, context then. In August 2014, um, which is the reference point for this talk, um, was prior to the Paris Agreement, as we heard last night. Um, and I've highlighted here the text from Article 2. We were already starting to have a handle, but I think in the last three years we have a much stronger handle on how any of our future scenarios that achieve 2 degrees C are relying strongly on carbon dioxide removal methods within them. After the, the Paris Agreement and the agreement of this text, um, 1.5 is also therefore strongly dependent on um, carbon dioxide removal. And so um, the, the use of carbon dioxide removal was there in the future scenarios, but it wasn't so well understood to be um, the kind of the dependence of it wasn't as um, wasn't as clear. And I think in the last three years, there's been a lot of work to really highlight how getting to two degrees C and definitely achieving 1.5 is very dependent on our ability to remove large amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. I'd also like to draw attention to Article 4, which makes reference about uh, balancing sinks and sources. And this is definitely starting to push up the agenda I, from my perspective from a national scale. Um, uh, my interactions with government, they're interested in finding out what role carbon dioxide removal might be able to play in achieving um, at a national scale balances of sources and sinks of carbon. So where are we headed? This is a graph of our current CO2 emissions from fossil fuels and cement. Um, you'll see um, this is in gigatons of CO2 per year on the y-axis. In black, you have your historical emissions. This is data from the Global Carbon Project. And off into the future, we have our four different colored sets of scenarios about where we may be headed. Um, just a comment that um, uh, 8.5 is a very high scenario. Business as usual will probably come in just a little bit below that. Um, but the ones I'd like to focus on are the yellow group, um, the RCP 4.5, which would end us in a world at the end of the century um, of temperatures between 1.7 and 3.2. And in blue, the RCP 2.6, um, uh, which is more, are more likely for 2 degrees C. And you will see that our current trajectory is not necessarily in line with both of those yet. But one of the big take-home messages from this slide is that bit at the bottom there, net negative global emissions. The impact of our energy industry will be to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. The net impact of that by the end of the century. So that's 2070 onwards. Actually, this involves carbon dioxide removal methods in these scenarios starting from about 2020. Um, of all those blue scenarios, 101 of the 116 blue scenarios have negative emissions in them, and of the 10 that don't, they started to, um, they started to pull away from, it's like they peaked in emissions in 2010. Okay, so just reinforcing that carbon dioxide removal methods are thoroughly embedded in um, ideas about how we might get to 2 degrees C. So this a couple of slides takes a little bit more time, but I think it's a really useful graphic to have a look at. What you are looking at here is a set of three um, scenarios you are seeing in the black line at the top. You are seeing um, the business as usual a case for three different imaginings of the future global socioeconomic system. One in which um, sustainability, um, we have a very uh, global coordinated effort towards highly sustainable approaches, uh, a middle of the road is a middle of the road scenario, or a regional, re regional rivalry which has much less global cooperation in it, so that's why the black lines in each are different. And what you're seeing in those wedges of colour, if you like, are how you would move from that business as usual to a pathway that is consistent with, in this case, RCP 4.5, so our two to three degrees scenario. So in the blue, you have changes, for example, savings, for example, coming from uh, energy demand, as opposed to in the uh, bright pink, you have the, the dark pink, you have um, changes in energy supply. And what I just wanted to note um, is the pale green at the top, just underneath that black line, is the biomass with CCS, which is the form of carbon dioxide removal that's most commonly found in these scenarios. So same thing again, 
but for 2 degrees C, so you see we've got much more effort now because we're trying to go for a lower temperature target. So the lower temperature target, we are implying much greater effort in terms of decarbonisation of our energy system through supply and demand, but also a larger amount of carbon dioxide removal, mostly in these cases from biomass energy combined with carbon capture and storage. Um, I will pick that story back up again in a moment, but I just want to, um, that's the context, okay? So this carbon dioxide removal is happening in these future emission scenarios that um, are consistent with 2 degrees C and consistent with 1.5 degrees C. So carbon dioxide removal then, um, the reason it's in there, the reason it's being used is because essentially it allows you to overspend your carbon budget. It allows you to emit more CO2 in the near term and remove it in the latter half of the century. That's what it's letting you do. It's letting you resolve the fact that we don't have a very small cumulative carbon budget left to spend for each of these temperature targets. So it allows you to, um, it allows you to transition and decarbonise the economy in a smoother manner by emitting more in the near term and removing it later. It also allows the possibility to tackle some hard to abate areas. For example, if we think about the full suite of greenhouse gases, it allows us to tackle a difficult problem of non-CO2 emissions, um, such as methane, um, from agriculture out into the future. Just as a little bit of um, naming and definitions, the term greenhouse gas removal is also used um, because there has been some work looking at ways in which we could remove methane, so that is a, a broader church, if you like. Um, and also negative emissions technologies is another phrase you'll see used quite commonly. This is a graphic I've borrowed from a forthcoming review paper led by Mark Lawrence, um, which um, is one of the things I like about this graphic is that it's trying to articulate this issue of um, the fuzzy boundaries that exist between what is CDR and what is mitigation. The IPCC defines mitigation as um, reducing emissions and enhancing sinks, and a number of CDR methods principally attempt to enhance sinks. Um, and so um, that's what um, I like about this graphic, and it's an important point, that it's not a very clearly delineated um, difference between mitigation efforts and CDR. It is a, a blurred, fuzzy boundary, but definitely something that's important when we think about the kind of amount of CDR assumed in those future scenarios is the scale of these interventions. It's the scale of these interventions and their impacts that in themselves will have quite significant side effects and have um, particular governance issues around them as well. So here is just a list of some of the main ones. Um, uh, this is not an exhaustive list. There are others, blue carbon, etc. There are variations within this. Each of these in themselves sometimes represent a multitude of ways of doing this. Um, Aforestation and reforestation, um, attempting to get more carbon into our standing stock of biomass. Uh, biochar, so the um, pyrolyzing um, uh, material and then putting it into the soils. Or soil sequestration, attempting to enhance soil carbon storage. Both of those are trying to get more carbon into our um, soils. Ocean fertilization, um, enhanced weathering, um, biomass energy with CCS and direct air capture storage. I will focus in the rest of the talk a little bit more. I'll briefly talk about biochar and soils, and then I'm going to talk about enhanced weathering and a bit more about the biomass energy with CCS. Um, just again, reflecting my personal um, interests. Um, just wanted to point out, there has been a big growth in literature. You're seeing a graph here for looking at, um, uh, led by Jan Minx, um, looking at um, publications that are on nets, negative emission technologies or CDR, a big growth in it. What I would, my, my opinion on this is that there is no coherent CDR community, especially around land management, soils, afforestation. They are distinct separate communities that, in, um, that are much more focused on mitigation um, and are not necessarily um, embracing of the carbon dioxide removal as a term. Um, and so there's quite a lot of isolated interdisciplinary work, which there's definitely some work there to pull together those insights and make sure we are up to speed on the latest. Um, the NAS report um, did a good job of reviewing where we were at up until July 2015. Um, and just to point, anybody working in this sector has a slightly stressed look about their face because they're frantically trying to get a um, paper submitted by the 1st of November, which would mean it would be considered for the upcoming special report on 1.5 that the IPCC is doing. Um, so soil carbon sequestration and biochar, just um, a couple of headline messages from where what we know about this. They're both fairly, in a per annum uh, basis, small players. There is an issue with soil carbon sequestration around sink saturation. That's dependent on climate, soil type, 
and other factors, um, and also reversibility. In terms of biochar addition to soils, a similar size kind of potential per year there. Again, there is a slight sink saturation issue, but that's over a much longer time scale. And there's some inconclusive evidence at the moment around a possible priming effect, which might work against um, the system. But they have lots of other positive co-benefits. Um, so they might be smaller in scale, but they have other benefits. Both have a lower impact on land use and water and nutrients um, and, and so on. And so they are potentially very useful and potentially very useful at a small scale, but whether they have a big global um, uh, part to play is yet to be seen. A few slides on enhanced weathering then, which is one of the ones that has a, a higher potential. Enhanced weathering um, would involve the extraction of minerals and then deposition either on the land or on the coast or in the oceans. And essentially, you're trying to sequester carbon either through carbonation or ocean alkalinity. Um, in terms of what kind of capacity we're talking about here, some recent work is very dependent on previous emissions, but some recent work would point at the um, hundreds of gigaton scale in the oceans and slightly less than that, but still non-trivial um, in terms of land surface. Um, but then the question that often comes about about achieving enhanced weathering is around the energy demand. So there's energy requirements at all of the various stages in the process there from extraction through to application. Um, initially, the transport element was thought to be a problem, but um, it turns out it might not be as limiting as initially thought. Some work in 2014 there. But the energy demand for milling, for getting that material down to a fine enough grain size in order to make the kinetics of the mineral dissolution work in your favour, is still highly uncertain, and that's an area of work that's ongoing. So the BECs then that we have, the biomass energy with carbon capture and storage that we have in future um, scenarios. I'm now showing you a plot of um, total CO2 removal. The majority of this is coming from this biomass energy. Um, looking at the um, scenarios um, in blue there on that, the orange ones are for 2 degrees C and the blue is for 1.5. So you see that when we move from 2 to 1.5, you need to do more of this stuff sooner. Okay. Um, uh, the amount of biomass energy with carbon capture and storage in future scenarios, if you look at all the two degree scenarios, you're talking about between 10 and 30% of primary energy by the end of the century. Now, 10% of our primary energy right now is provided by biomass, but over 77% of that is in the form of traditional biomass use, wood and charcoal. Okay. There's only a very small fraction is um, uh, modern bioenergy use, um, about a third is for um, heating in houses, about a third for energy generation and combined heat and power, and about a third for road transport. Okay, so you are massively scaling up modern bioenergy and principally, as we'll see in the next slide, changing the resources that you'd be using there. So this bi combining biomass energy with carbon capture and storage actually covers a multitude of technologies that they include electricity generation, Hydrogen production within the scenarios, they tend, that hydrogen production tends to kick in after 2050, but also liquid transport fuels, um, uh, liquid fuels predominantly used in the transport sector. So there, um, it is, covers a multitude of particular technologies. It is important to note that without carbon capture and storage, you don't get the BECs because you are feeding into the carbon capture and storage, or direct air capture and storage either. And carbon capture and storage makes your power generation more expensive and it makes it less, less efficient. This is, CCS is not a natural development in power generation. It is something that will come about because of strong policy um, action and incentives. Um, it is not going to materialize on its, as it, of an, on its own. Okay? It requires um, that. And this is all, all of this future scenario is predicated on a CCS infrastructure, of which we currently have nothing at a gigaton scale. And almost everything we have around CCS is uh, development stage testing and supported, government supported um, uh, work, and, unless you're enhancing oil recovery. Um, we can talk about that over coffee. Um, there's also a little bit of afforestation in some of these scenarios, um, but definitely the biggest player is the biomass energy with carbon capture and storage. Why is that the type of CDR that's in there then? Uh, this graphic, I think, summarizes that nicely. What you're looking at here is the net energy required. And in orange is some uh, direct air capture and some enhanced weathering. And in the purple and green are different resourced biomass energies. You provide, BEX provides energy. So an integrated assessment model it's, um, will always prefer it over something that just requires energy to remove carbon. Um, the kind of crops you'd be using are either dedicated second generation um, bioenergy bio crops such as miscanthus or switchgrass or um, fast growing tree species like poplar, willow or eucalyptus. Um, but it's important to note, it sometimes gets overlooked, um, 
up to half of the biomass assumed in these future scenarios that use a lot of BEX is coming from residues. It's coming from waste products from the forestry industry and agricultural industry. And there's a lot of work right now going on looking at assessing our residue availability and what might be available. What um, there's some potential around municipal solid waste and other streams that might be quite valuable residue streams um, uh, to provide uh, some of this um, large demand for biomass energy resource in a more sustainable way that doesn't compete, for example, with land availability. Next slide. Um, this, is a, um, this is just a graphic, actually, that shows you um, some of the scenarios in a, a piece of work um, by Lena Boyson, who will be um, presenting in one of the sessions later in the conference. But I just wanted to help to get you to think about translating large amounts of biomass energy into where this might be. Um, created. As I said, half of it is coming from biomass plantations, um, but there's lots of questions and it gets very complicated around in terms of interacting with other systems around whether you're using productive or marginal lands, what the water and nutrient demands are, what it means for expansion of, of cultivation in certain areas, and with that, the direct and indirect land use change impacts, especially on soil carbon, for example, but also the physical feedbacks around the climate, physical feedbacks around albedo and transpiration. So there's a lot of work. This is a real kind of um, area that is ongoing right now, trying to unpack and deal with some of these issues and find out a bit more about the feasibility there. Um, so there's a number of these constraints on um, CDR methods, principally because um, you're dealing with some highly interconnected systems, highly interconnected social systems around the energy system and energy demand, around food provision, around water use and water availability. So this competition between different types of CDR and the competition for land use and resource use um, around CDR versus our other requirements on land and the impact that then has on biodiversity and conservation. Um, just a note that another area that requires a bit more attention is around the carbon cycle feedbacks. Overall carbon cycle feedbacks um, impact the effectiveness of carbon removed from the atmosphere. This graphic just shows schematically how different types of CDR in, interact with different components of the carbon, um, carbon cycle. Generally, under a low emission future, under an RCP 2.6, for example, the carbon sinks, which currently work for us by removing about half of the CO2 we emit to the atmosphere each year, will start to weaken and then even potentially work against us a little once you get down to low emissions, uh, very low emissions and uh, long-lasting uh, long negative emissions. Um, uh, but there's also localised carbon cycle impacts that require more attention, and I was just going to flag that a piece of work that's happening right now is the carbon dioxide um, removal modelling into comparison project. For more about that, that will be presented in one of the sessions on Thursday um, to find out a bit more about the role of carbon cycle feedbacks and its interactions with CDR. So in summary then, um, the Paris goals of 2 degrees C and 1.5 require um, carbon dioxide removal. And at the moment, most of that within the future scenarios of our global energy system and land use and assume it is being delivered by biomass energy with carbon capture and storage. But the feasibility of this BEX is something that's difficult to assess, especially at this scale, because it's highly interconnected with these existing social systems around food and energy and water and biodiversity. And it's important to note that when you're talking about this global scale CDR, it does start to raise a number of governance issues. Um, you shouldn't be misled into thinking that this kind of large scale intervention in the climate system is somehow benign just because it involves growing plants or trees. Uh, particularly, for example, around accounting and verification. How do we know that that system, that um, BEX system that we have set in place, is delivering the amount of carbon removed that we assume it is? How do we account for genuinely sustainable biomass resources that aren't having a negative impact through land use, either direct or indirect land use change, and that all those um, elements of the system are being accounted for? Just to remind you that if you don't have CCS infrastructure, you don't have BECs or direct air capture. The ability to upscale biomass energy is comparatively straightforward. You can plant a different crop next year. We have um, the machinery and the infrastructure in place to change our agriculture. The CCS is large capital investment infrastructure generally especially around electricity generation. So it requires something, um, it requires this strong policy intervention to make this, um, uh, to make this uh, be realised. 
about enhanced weathering. There's definitely been a lot more interest in this in the last few years. The capacity is definitely there. It's up there as one of the big capacity ones. Um, but the question at the moment is uh, centering around the kind of energy demand for milling. I've not covered everything. I haven't, for example, covered direct air capture, which is the other um, big component. But so just as my final slide, if you're interested in unpacking this a bit more, talking to some of the people whose slides I've used here um, and whose work I've presented, then I've highlighted a number of sessions that um, uh, cover CDR. Specifically, um, I'm running the interdisciplinary CDR session on Wednesday, and uh, David Keller is running the Earth System and CDR session on Thursday. And the other ones listed have... Um, uh, open their calls and hoping to include um, CDR content as well, so you can pick up some of these topics there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Nem, for that fantastic overview. Um, and I'll move us right on to the next talk by Ben Kravitz. Uh, ben is a climate scientist in the Atmospheric Sciences and Global Change Division at the U.S. Department of Energy's Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and coordinator of the Geoengineering Model Intercomparison Project, GEOMIP, and he's also a member of the CEC 17 Steering Committee. All right, thanks everyone. Um, so I'm going to be talking about everything we've learned since CEC 14 on SRM, which is totally not true. Um, I, am, I couldn't possibly cover everything. If your work isn't in here, I'm sorry, it's not, it's not an oversight. I couldn't do it all, or maybe it is an oversight, and I truly apologize for that. Um, I've deliberately not included things that I thought you would hear about here, because the people here can explain their work a lot better than I possibly can. Um, I'd also like to thank the steering committee and the advisory group for giving me suggestions on what to include in here. So um, a bit of an outline of what I want to talk about. First, why are we even talking about SRM? Um, I want to go into some of the latest advances in the science of SRM, some deeper dives, and then some broader scope, and then a few research opportunities um, that I see based on what we've learned in the past three years and what we haven't learned in the past three years. So some important caveats. Um, there haven't been explicit outdoor field tests of SRM on the process level or deployment scale. I will talk about that a little bit. David Keith is going to talk about his plans for that, um, I think, immediately after me. Um, natural science study of SRM has been conducted in models or by using natural analogs. We haven't done this. There are no observations. That hasn't changed. Um, everything I'm going to be talking about in here is from single or multiple model simulations, mostly of stratospheric sulfate aerosol geoengineering. I've got a little bit on marine cloud brightening. Um, and uh, I'm going to, there are going to be a few slides that haven't changed since CEC 14. I'll talk about those in just a second as to why. So first, why are we even talking about SRM? So this was a, a paper that came out in 2015 in Science where they did um, a, a whole bunch of simulations of different scenarios and looked at the probability based on different, um, different ambitions as to whether we would meet the two degree target or the one and a half degree target. So everything in gray is two degrees or below, or below everything in orange is not. Um, it's not looking good according to these results. So this People, this is one of the motivations for talking about at SRM. People are worried that we're not going to meet two degrees and all the implications thereof. Um, apologies to John, I couldn't find the, the actual napkin diagram, so I had to make one really quickly. I like yours better, so hope you'll forgive me for that. Um, why, how might we use SRM as part of a portfolio of responses to climate change? Um, so there's business as usual up at the top. CDR can get us some, mitigation can get us somewhere, and mitigation is going to have to get us somewhere eventually. We can't keep putting CO2 in the atmosphere. CDR has to get us somewhere else. And then the rest in here, so there's that yellow and orange part, is um, one of the, the the proposed means of using SRM, peak shaving. So getting us below that dangerous warming threshold, whatever that is. You'll note I didn't put any numbers on this figure. I don't know what those numbers are. Um, that's a, a matter for vigorous discussion that I hope happens here. Um, another thing to point out, um, SRM is fast, cheap, and imperfect. So the, the top figure there is, um, an example of trade-offs that we see in SRM that we've seen very early on. You can't balance 
global mean temperature and global mean precipitation by just using SRM in, as we've simulated it here. Um, the, the bottom right figure is um, some other simulations that were the first GCM simulations done by Alan Roebuck. Um, there's the noted termination shock. If you turn off geoengineering suddenly, then you get a rapid rebound of the climate system. Um, generally not considered a good thing. So uh, these are risks worth keeping in mind when talking about SRN. Um, so it's, it's a really common way to break up SRM into different altitudes of where they'd have effects. So at the very top is space mirrors. Um, we simulate that by turning down the sun. I don't know how you'd actually do that. Um, stratospheric aerosols are a very common one. Marine cloud brightening is another very common one. Um, Cirrus thinning isn't included in here because it's not exactly reflective, but it's often talked about in SRM, um, in SRM conversations. Um, and then surface modification ones as well. So um, you've probably seen all of these before. So this one is not a new figure. Um, it, it's not a new result since 2014. I'm putting it up here because um, our, our thinking hasn't, on this hasn't really changed all that much. So uh, precipitation is reduced by geoengineering but strengthened by climate change. So if, and this is showing, so on the, the left is a global average precipitation, in the middle is a global monsoon index, and on the right is an indicator of tropical precipitation. So you see um, for CO2 it goes up, for geoengineering it goes down, and it's, if you offset all of the warming from an increase in CO2, you end up over drying. Um, we know this, and we, we also know from simulations that if you do less geoengineering, you might not overdry, but you'd end up a little warmer. So we haven't seen anything really new in the past three years that would overturn this. Um, this is new, I believe, since the last one. This is looking at extreme events. So um, we, for these results, we took daily um, model output from 12 different models, and we looked at the probability distributions of temperature on the left and precipitation on the right. So the blue is the baseline, the red is a high CO2 world, and the green is geoengineering. Um, and you'll notice the blue and the green, um, the overlap is not perfect, but they're fairly close. Um, if you look at the tails, you will see some differences. So for example, in on the left in a geoengineering world, there might be a few more extreme cold events according to these simulations. But it's, they're a lot more similar, the baseline and geoengineering are a lot more similar to each other than either is to the high CO2 world. Um, here's another one that uh, is fairly recent looking at um, hurricane storm surge severity and frequency. So this is um, in Katrina's per decade to give you an idea of a metric. Um, Katrina was a, uh, we still remember it in the US. Um, so uh, the, the dashed line is no climate engineering and the solid line is with climate engineering. And you can see the, the number of Katrina's per decade as, as calculated through these various metrics that we calculated is reduced. Um, so there's, there's potential in here to offset some extreme events. Another one, um, this is from Lily Shah, uh, looking at geoengineering effects on agriculture in China. So um, the, geoeng the summary of the slide is geoengineering, in this case experiment G2, for those of you who know what that means, if you don't just ask me later, reduces rice production but increases maize production. And the reason for that is maize is sensitive to hot temperatures. So one of the effects of geoengineering, at least as simulated here, is to reduce temperatures. So it makes sense that that would work. Um, here's another one where we've expanded our look at the cryosphere. It's not just about sea ice anymore. So um, all that, the caveats buried in this, there, this team looked at um, high mountain glaciers in Asia. And they showed, um, so, According to these simulations, which did not offset all climate change, um, geoengineering can, can prevent some of the loss of glacier volume and consequently some of the sea level rise that might be experienced under these scenarios of climate change. Um, you'll notice that none of the lines are flat straight across. It's not a perfect offset, but it does something. Um, so 
here's a, a plot. Um, we have oceanographers working with us now too, so thank you to those of you who are in, in the audience who are oceanographers and like talking to us. Um, this is looking at restoration of the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. For those of you who aren't oceanographers and don't know what that is, um, so the movie The Day After Tomorrow was a delightful take on what would happen if the AMOC shut down. Um, it's, it's a big deal. Um, so, the, again, um, we're seeing a, a common signal that CO2, the CO2 simulations here or the, uh, cause a, a decrease in the AMOC strength, but um, there's a partial restoration due to geoengineering. So you'll, you're noticing there's a, a common theme in a lot of the results I've presented that we keep learning over the past three years. CO2 does something and geoengineering offsets that something in a lot of cases. Now, um, there's a lot of selection bias going on here. These are the things we've analyzed. These are not everything. So um, I have a suspicion that once we start looking at different variables or regional effects, we're not gonna see such a clean picture. There are gonna start being trade-offs. There are gonna be things where geoengineering makes things worse. I'd like to know what those are. Um, and there's been some work on that but that I'm not highlighting here. Um, so here's a, a picture of marine cloud brightening, and this is an interesting result that um, we found. So as effective without clouds, basically if you spray a bunch of salt particles into the air um, t in the hopes that you're going to brighten clouds, those salt particles reflect sunlight too. And they do a pretty good job of it, in some cases a better job than clouds. Clouds are tricky, you can't brighten them all the time and you can't brighten them everywhere. Um, this kind of works pretty much everywhere there's sunlight. So um, I'm not gonna pass judgment on that, it's a result. Uh, another perspective that we've uh, come across recently is a design perspective. So different strategies have different effects. Um, we used to keep asking, what will climate engineering do? And I, I think we're getting to the point where we're realizing that's not necessarily the most useful question it will do whatever you tell it to do within certain boundaries. Um, so for example, that picture on the left, which is um, from 2013, shows different evaporation, um, it, different evaporation time series for different methods of geoengineering. On the right are different temperature patterns for different amounts of solar reduction. So um, we, we need to start asking, what does the space of that look like? Um, can climate engineering do what society wants it to do? Now, I'm not going to say what society wants it to do. What I'm saying is we need to figure out that space. What can geoengineering do? Um, and that leads into, I think, a research opportunity. Um, so the, on the left is a figure from 2013, and on the right is a, a figure from a paper that was just accepted not too long ago, looking at, um, different spatial patterns of, on the left is solar reduction, different temporal patterns of solar reduction. On the right, different locations of injection of SO2 into the stratosphere and seeing what are the different climate effects that we can get by varying those parameters. So I think there's a lot of rich area to explore in this space. Um, another research opportunity. So, in the past, when we've talked about stratospheric geoengineering of any kind, we've mostly talked about sulfate aerosols, and we've mostly talked about injecting SO2 into the stratosphere. So that's not necessarily a foregone conclusion, and that was started a long time ago. On the, the left there is Pierce et al. looking at um, directly condensing H2SO4 into particles. Um, on the right is some pretty recent work out of the Harvard group looking at totally different particle compositions and their effect on ozone. So it stands to reason that different particles would give you different effects because they interact with um, solar radiation differently. They have different stratospheric heating effects, different dynamics. And so going through all of these, this is another aspect of the design problem. Are there certain particles that do things that are more or less desirable, whatever that means, than others? Um, another research opportunity that I won't get into too much detail because this is what David's going to talk about, field experiments. Um, at a certain point, climate models can only get us so far. So the question is, what might a field experiment look like? Um, what would it accomplish? Um, there's an important role for limited scope field studies, and you're going to hear a lot about that throughout the week. There's plenty of time devoted to it. 
This one, this is not a new figure, but I'm putting it up anyway because I still really want an answer. Um, so as Nem talked about, the carbon cycle is really important to understand. Um, so our Earth system models have carbon cycles in them and they have different strengths. You can see these models grouped into kind of three different groups and the ones at the bottom have a nitrogen cycle. I'm not saying the nitrogen cycle is correct, but it sure seems important. Um, this is something that we really need to figure out. And, and this is not necessarily just a geoengineering question, although there are clear implications for SRM. This is a basic science question. Um, another research opportunity, impacts and intersectoral interactions. So on the, on the left there is change in terrestrial photosynthesis rate in one of the newer geoengineering experiments, again by Lily Shaw. Um, looking at, um, it, it's related to the figure previously, looking at light available for plants and how they react to that. Um, so an important impact, I mean, people, people need plants, we, we like to eat. Um, on the right there is an interesting one that's not a geoengineering result, but it, it is a result that I wanted to point out. So um, the top panel there is RCP 4.5, which is a scenario with some mitigation. The bottom panel is RCP 8.5, which basically doesn't have mitigation in it. And what you're looking at is water deficit change. There's a lot more orange in the mitigation scenario than the business as usual scenario. And that's because in the, in that scenario, in order to meet mitigation efforts, they grow a lot more biofuel. That, that draws on water resources. Um, these intersectoral impacts have pretty important implications for the work that we're talking about here. So I have a really big question. What about geoengineering? And do we have a framework in which we can start modeling those effects? Um, I'm a natural scientist. I am not very good at talking about governance. Um, there are plenty of people here who are. Please go to their sessions. There is so much cool stuff going on here. Um, you're gonna hear all about, some, all about it throughout the week and actually in a couple minutes as well. Um, and I also wanted to include a shout out to some people who are in the audience that this paper on public engagement came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, there, there are also going to be some presentations here on public engagement. Um, I, I, again, I'm not qualified to talk about this stuff, but there are smart people here who are. Please bother them. So, a brief wholly insufficient summary of everything I've talked about. Um, for a lot of the things that I've talked about, uh, and a lot of the things that we've seen over the past few years, a world with SRM looks a lot more like today than many high CO2 worlds for a wide variety of variables. Might look different for other variables and there will likely be differential winners and losers. These are things we need to understand. Um, based on everything I've seen, it's going to be pretty hard to hit one and a half or two degrees C without SRM. I'm not going to say it's impossible, that's far beyond me, but it's a hard problem. Um, this brings up a risk-risk risk, risk framework that's come up a lot in this community. What's the risk of doing SRM versus not doing SRM? Um, there's another, I've put 20 years of modeling work to be done. So what will models be able to do in 20 years that they can't do now? How will that help us? This is an open question. There are necessarily limits to what models can provide. What are those limits and what are some useful field experiments that could be done? And a, a point that I'd really like to drive home, if SRM is unworkable, let's say we find a deal breaker somewhere down the line, we need to know now. What, what, I, what terrifies me is that people are gonna start relying on it and then we find out later that it's not gonna work and we're already locked in. So that's all I've got, thank you. It should be working. Is it working? It seems to be working. All right. Thank you very much, Ben, uh, for that fantastic overview. Uh, now we're going to move into a part of the session that will have introductions to some of the major initiatives and projects that have been coming out over the last couple of years in this field. And we'll start out uh, with David Keith, uh, who won't be talking about his field experiment, which he will be doing uh, tomorrow afternoon in the plenary session. Today he'll be talking about Harvard University's Solar Geoengineering Research Program as its faculty director.
Thank you. Yeah, my understanding is he wanted uh, updates of, of uh, larger efforts that are starting out. And so um, we've started something called Harvard's Solar Geoengineering Research Program. So this is a Harvard-wide um, interdisciplinary effort to look at solar geoengineering. It's centered in Harvard University's Center for the Environment. And I'll tell you a little bit about its governance, its funding, and the kinds of research that we propose to do. Um, I'd say there are, first of all, three broad research tracks in, inside SGRP, advancing the science and technology of solar geoengineering, assessing efficacy and risks, and understanding governance and social implications. In all of these, one of the sort of explicit cross-cutting goals is we want to fund work. This is an effort that basically puts money in a committee that then funds research across Harvard. Doesn't control it, but funds it. We want to encourage people, new people, to enter the field, and we want to encourage people to look for ways in which these technologies fail, either are there social failures or technical failures. Um, I, three important cross-cutting principles are that we want it to be open access, no IP, transparency, et cetera. We want it to be collaborative, both within Harvard and, and around the world, and we want it to be policy relevant. This isn't just academic research. Um, so looking into those research tracks, in advancing science technology, for example, we're working on developing novel aerosols that might uh, reduce or reverse ozone loss, as you heard, or uh, have optical properties that reduce the heating of the lower stratosphere. Developing methods to accurately estimate the radiative forcing uh, from uh, aerosols. Um, developing field experiments, like the one I should say it's not my field experiment, the field experiment that Frank Koich and I are involved in that we'll talk about later. And there's a set of work on on assessing efficacy and risks. So for example, the analysis of historical analogs, such as the impact of volcanic eruptions on extreme, extreme precipitation, some work that Peter Hoiberg has been thinking about, or uh, looking at mass balance of the Greenland ice cap. Uh, another question is any materials that were introduced into the stratosphere will, of course, eventually come down to the lower atmosphere. And we're particularly interested in the question of whether some of the uh, uh, aerosols in the stratosphere might act as ice uh, nucleating as ice nuclei in the uh, upper troposphere and so interact with cirrus clouds in a way that might actually be like uh, um, uh, cirrus cloud climate engineering or perhaps have the reverse sign. I think we actually don't know even the sign of, of the result. Um, to give you some specific examples, I would cite Peter Irvine's recent work with the ultra high resolution model at GFDL. Uh, and this also involves Carrie Emanuel looking at response of uh, tropical cyclones and uh, the specific response of the I I I uh, hydrological cycle, especially extreme events, to uh, uh, solar stream engineering. And also Katie Dagan's new work on uh, drought frequency, where I think she's really done some kind of groundbreaking work understanding better what are the uh, ways that drought frequency is determined both by the change in CO2, which changes the way plants can, can uh, exhale water, their stomatal resistance, but also changes the temperature. Um, then there's a, a broad set of work on governance and social implications. So for example, there's work on understanding um, coalition formation, ideas that are often called climate clubs, the way in which uh, a coalition of, of countries might um, uh, commit to major emissions reductions, as at least be the hope, uh, as a condition of participation in making decisions about geoengineering. So this idea has been out there for a while, but there's several research efforts trying to understand that better. There's a, a, a bunch of research happening right now, some of it just being accepted for publication on public perceptions and, and more work starting up on, on risk attitudes. So for example, Asim Mahajan, a, a PhD with Dustin Tingley, uh, uh, has some nice new work from the Congressional Election Survey, a kind of major high quality US survey that was run just in 2016. And actually I'll give you a few tidbits there. No, I don't have time to give you tidbits. Uh, 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 the most fun tidbit is that 40% of, of the people uh, in that survey, high, quite a high quality survey, thinks the government has a secret program that uses airplanes to put harmful chemicals into the air. Um, but it's also true that 80% support or strongly support research. And, and nicely, that's a, a significantly higher number than uh, support deployment. Um, the program is governed by an advisory committee. And that advisory committee is, is first of all, Peter Hoybers and Dan Schrag, who jointly run the uh, the interfaculty Harvard University Center for the Environment that was a pre-existing entity that spans the whole university across the different uh, uh, faculties. Um, 
and, and also Elsie Sun, Professor Elsie Sunderland and Dustin Tingley. Uh, Elsie is an environmental geoscientist, Dustin uh, political science, uh, myself as faculty director, and Gernot Wagner as executive director of the program. Uh, we're aiming to raise as much as 20 million over uh, seven years for the thing. We're now a little over 8 million, and uh, the funders are all listed publicly on the website, I should say, which is uh, uh, geoengineering.environment.harvard.edu. And important examples are Open Philanthropy, the Hewlett Foundation, and, and individual philanthropists like Len Baker. And then finally, I want to say there's opportunities. We'd like to engage the community more broadly. So there's, uh, uh, most importantly, graduate and postgraduate fellowships that are funded throughout the university, and, and you simply have to find a Harvard host, and then the committee has to approve. And there's also residency programs to support visiting scholars who want to come to Harvard and work with some scholar somewhere at Harvard uh, on topics relevant to, to solar geoengineering. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, David. And uh, next up is Doug McMartin, who will be uh, talking about the 2017 Gordon Research Conference on Radiation Management Climate Engineering as its vice chair. So um, uh, we had, uh, back at the end of July, the first, uh, very successful first inaugural conference, uh, Gordon Research Conference on Radiation Management side of climate engineering. Uh, and so thanks in particular to Alan Robach and David Keith, who did an enormous amount of work putting this together. Um, I don't want to necessarily go through all of the details of things that we learned about that, because you just had a great talk from Ben talking about all of the, the state of knowledge of the physical climate side of things. Uh, what I do want to do is invite you to the next one. Uh, we have not yet been approved. We should know fairly soon whether we're approved for the next conference. Uh, but the Gordon Research Conferences are intended to be a series uh, every other year. The, I looked it up, the longest running Gordon Research Conference started in 1950. Um, the, uh, we also did put in a request to change from odd numbered years to even numbered years. So assuming that we are approved uh, the next conference will be in 2020. Uh, hopefully we'll have lots of interesting things that we've learned about uh, the climate response to geoengineering by then. Um, and the reason that I'm talking instead of uh, uh, David and Alan is that the chairs for the next meeting will be Trudy, Strelvmo, and me. And the co-chairs for the next meeting will be Simone Tilms and um, Ulrika uh, Lohmann and then they will do, would then be the chairs of the 2022 meeting. So the focus of the Gordon Research Conference, so first of all, it's on the radiation management side, not on the CDR side, and the focus is on the physical climate uh, aspects, uh, including the impacts and economic assessment and so forth. So it's very complementary to this conference, uh, and I certainly hope that, that this conference also continues so that we can have uh, uh, both, both parts of the dialogue. Uh, but I want to make sure that people under, uh, are aware. Uh, we sort of invite everybody to be there. If you're interested in uh, radiation management uh, from the social side, from the governance side, from economic side, uh, philosophy side, uh, we welcome, although the talks will generally be on the physical climate side, I don't have to advertise to this group that that's pretty much inseparable from the context in which that research occurs. Uh, and so I welcome everybody's presence uh, as part of that dialogue, uh, and both, both in terms of how thing, what questions are being asked uh, and then the impact of those questions. Um, the one other thing I'll, I'll just add, this was one of my uh, all-time favorite conferences I've been to. Um, the, the organization of the conference has lots of time for discussion, both after the talks um, and between sessions. Um, so there's lots of time to get into great detailed discussions about uh, the state of the technology, the state of the knowledge. Um, and the, the talks themselves are much longer and in depth uh, on the various subjects. So I'll stop there. Um, hope to see everybody in, in 2020 at the next Gordon Conference, assuming, assuming that goes forward. Right, thank you very much, Doug. Uh, next up is uh, Janos Pastor, who will be talking about the Carnegie Climate Geoengineering Governance Initiative, or C2G2, as its executive director. 
thank you and uh, good morning. Um, I think we can, I don't need to say too much about uh, uh, the background. Uh, we've talked enough about uh, uh, the reason why we're in deep trouble in terms of climate. And uh, I think there has also been enough talk about uh, why uh, scientists have been proposing many different geoengineering options. So that urgency and that issue is there. Uh, what we're all about at uh, C2G2, at the Car uh, Carnegie Climate Geoengineering Governance Initiative, is to understand the governance requirements of these technologies. And uh, uh, our objective is quite simple, is to, uh, to catalyze and, and contribute to the societal, wide societal debate we need to have about the governance of these technologies, uh, and uh, thereby also help to develop elements of the governance frameworks that we will need. Now, uh, the urgency is there, because some of this will take quite a lot of time. Uh, we also heard uh, uh, in the two previous sessions how much these systems are interrelated and governing interrelated systems is even more complicated than governing simple systems. So uh, we need to get going. And uh, uh, so uh, the governance of geoengineering matters, that's our tagline. Of, uh, and if you haven't seen our new website, please do that, uh, c2g2.net, and uh, you'll find some information there. Uh, our initiative is hosted by uh, the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs. It's a New York-based uh, think tank. Uh, we are, the initiative itself, the C2G initiative is virtual. Uh, we do exist, but we exist in different locations. Uh, uh, so we don't have a physical office as such. Uh, I have a number of colleagues who are here. Just raise your hand so that uh, you can see a few colleagues who are here uh, with me. Thank you. And. Uh, uh, as I said, our, our objective is to, to catalyze debate, uh, the society-wide debate that we need to have in order to reach uh, these governance uh, frameworks. Uh, our strategy is fairly simple. Uh, we try to engage with international organizations, non-governmental organizations, and a few countries, and try to engage them in this process of developing uh, governance uh, frameworks. Uh, we have... Um, uh, our ultimate result that we would like to see after a few years of work is that eventually governments put these issues on the agenda of the key intergovernmental processes, whether that be in some of the existing treaty bodies or the UN General Assembly, to address these issues properly, because that's what has to be done. But so far, most of the discussion has been in fora like this. Scientists, we need to shift the debate so that the policy people come. Now, uh, there's a lot one can talk about governance, uh, and we decided a few months ago that we need to focus on priorities. And we have three priorities I wanted to share you, with you those priorities. The first one, uh, it's the fact that research is taking place and some of that research needs to be governed. And it, as some of the laws apply, some don't apply. And so the, the, the first priority we have is governance of research that is both able to regulate it but also enable it to move in the direction that society wants. The second priority we have and that links to solar geoengineering. Uh, there, we do feel that there is a danger uh, that there may be some country, some individual, or some groups of countries who decide that they want to deploy solar geoengineering unilaterally in an ungoverned manner. And that we would like to avoid. So we're working toward an agreement between countries, uh, individuals, organizations, that there be no deployment of solar geoengineering until we know better the risks and benefits and until we figure out the governance requirements. So, and the third priority is perhaps the most immediate one that we've talked a lot about, carbon removal. It's something that is part of the package, and we know that, again, there needs to be governance of that, both at the domestic level and at the international level, both in terms of decision making and also about how we move forward. So thank you very much, and we look forward to working with you and come to our session at 11 o'clock when we talk more about governance. Thank you. And thank you very much, Janosch. Uh, next we have Linda Schneider, who works with the Heinrich Böll Foundation on international climate change policy and leads Böll's civil society project on geoengineering. Right, thank you. <clears throat> so just a quick note on the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, uh, since I assume some of you don't, are not familiar with the organization. Um, yeah, um, We're a political foundation affiliated with the German Green Party 
We're headquartered in Berlin and um, we have a network of over 30 regional and country offices all, all across the world and an extensive network of um, NGO organizations that, that we work with across the world. So for us, the topic of geoengineering is really integrated in the work on international environmental and climate policy that we're doing more broadly, um, which is centered around a critique um, of what we think are false solutions that are produced by uh, mainstream climate policy, um, as well as a strong focus on radical transformative mitigation action that actually does justice to the socio-ecological crisis that we're facing with climate change. Um, so the the direction that we're coming uh, to, the, to the issue of geoengineering is um, that we think that climate change is a soci socio-ecological crisis and not an engineering or technical problem. And at the same time, it's also not the only socio-ecological crisis we're facing, and biodiversity and species loss, lo and land and soil degradation, but also global social inequality and injustice are equally fundamental challenges um, and actually crises that mu must not be exacerbated by our response to climate change. Um, in our view, geoengineering will not be compatible with climate justice and sustainable development. We don't see a way how the large-scale rollout of, the, of such technologies um, would ever be compatible with human and land rights, with biodiversity and ecosystem protection, uh, with food security, democratic control and accountability, as well as climate and resource justice. So, our priority in our project as civil society is to make sure that the social, the political and the environmental consequences, um, risks and impacts um, of such technologies um, are adequately accounted for. Um, we also believe that we need a whole different discourse around geoengineering. We need one that is um, a lot more equitable and that actually takes seriously the concerns um, that, are, that are raised and articulated by civil society and um, the, the most vulnerable in particular. So our work is geared, to, geared towards building capacity in international civil society. To that end, we're producing a whole range of educational materials in different languages and usually in cooperation with our civil society partners across the world. Um, some recent um, publications include, just uh, from actually last week, um, a civil society uh, briefing on geoengineering governance, as well as uh, a more general briefing on, on geoengineering from earlier this year. We did um, a report on BACS together with Biofuel Watch, and we uh, supported a paper by the Tactical Tech uh, Collective on, on techno fixes. Uh, we also have a bigger report lined up to be published um, for the COP, um, and that, as well as some of the other publications that we do, we're doing in collaboration with the Etc. Group. Um, and other close civil society partners. Um, we also have the documents that I just mentioned, we have them with us printed, so if you're interested, you're welcome to um, take them and take a look. Another thing that I'd like to share with you is uh, the thing that you already have up on the screen, uh, which is an interactive world map of geoengineering experiments and projects, including weather modification projects as important precursors uh, to current attempts at large-scale climate intervention. Um, that's, a, that's a collaboration with the Etc. Group as well. Um, in this tool, you can you have a whole set of filters that you can apply. The screen's not actually it's not showing it uh, accurately, but um, so you have a set of tools that you can apply to the data. Um, you can click on any of those um, individual projects to get more information. So yeah, I guess you'll figure out how it works. Um, the, the idea behind this uh, map was actually to show to a broader public um, um, where the majority of which still think that geoengineering is uh, simply science fiction, uh, to show to them that uh, the many actual resources that are poured into these, what we think are false solutions. Um, and we also wanted to show that these ideas are not entirely new but they actually build and are based on, on a long record of attempts at manipulating weather and climate, and including the, the deployment of such technologies as means of warfare. So this, this was just a, a limited selection of the work that we do, but uh, since I don't have much time, I'll leave it at that. And uh, just finish by saying that um, since we believe that geoengineering is a deeply problematic destruction and deviation of what we should really be, do, be focusing and doing, 
We also work heavily on, on viable and safe alternatives, on real solutions that, are, that a climate just future can actually build on. Um, we think that the top priorities should be radical emission reduction pathways that transcend mainstream economic thinking um, and that go a lot further and also, also a lot faster than conventional mitigation action. We also find it important uh, to point out the necessity to carefully but sustain sustainably restore our global, ego global ecosystems uh, to increase natural sinks in a sustainable way. Um, if you're interested in the work that we do and um, to learn more about climate just pathways to 1.5 year, you're welcome to join us for the session uh, titled A Change of Course that's uh, taking place right after this plenary session in room 04, I believe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up we have Andreas Oschlis, uh, who will be presenting the German Research Foundations, the DFG's priority program on climate engineering, of which he is the coordinator. So our well, project uh, uh, priority program is really a bottom-up approach. And it started in 2009 as a well, um, initiative of concerned scientists in Germany. That was the year where we ran the, the last iron fertilization experiment. But also where some uh, international arguments were discussed, the Royal Society report came out on uh, climate engineering, and we had a number of roundtable meetings just to inform ourselves what is going on, is there, what is the interesting science, and should we really start employing PhD students on this topic, or is it, will it go away? It didn't go away. Uh, and then we uh, went on further with these uh, annual or biannual meetings, roundtable of, of open to all scientists in Germany. Um, we started our web page, uh, climate-engineering.eu, which you may know. So uh, there on a daily basis we have new information of what is going on, press coverage, uh, new scientific reports, policy papers. Everything is reported there every day for now six years. And Niels Matzner, who I think is here somewhere, he's running it uh, since that time. So, so spending a couple of hours every day, I think, to, well, there's some informatics help now to do it, to automize it. But that uh, was set up to inform ourselves, the different disciplines, about what is going on, but also to make it transparent to the public. And I think that has been very useful, so we got a lot of feedback from the interested public. Uh, they use this, they see it, and we w plan to continue this. Uh, a few years later, in 2013, we got funding from the German Research Foundation. So that's uh, uh, taxpayers' money. It's a kind of transparent way, a, a thorough international review process. And we got uh, funding, well, it's altogether about 9 million euros over six years. Uh, it's a nationwide project, different uh, institutes all over Germany and Switzerland, Austria as well, and it's very interdisciplinary. Natural sciences, economics, political sciences, international law, ethics, philosophy of science, and uh, even linguistics. So that's uh, about, natural science is about 25% of this, to give you a flavor. What do we do? We try to arrive at a comprehensive assessment. So we don't, we include SRM and CDR, and we think that is a good thing. So SRM helped us to attract many of the social scientists, because it's a new, it's a huge, interesting problem. But we also think, as we'll see, that CDR involves many of the same ethical and uh, governance issues, which uh, we wouldn't get that much attention if we didn't have SRM in our portfolio that we investigate. So we concentrate mostly on these three methods, on land, in the atmosphere, and in the ocean. And uh, our results so far, so it's about a little more on the midterm, is uh, we con you know, John Shepard is in the audience here, he's uh, produced this figure in the Royal Society report. It's all relative units, uh, affordability on the x-axis, uh, effectiveness on the y-axis, and colors and circle size, um, I mean, uh, readiness and safety. Uh, that was Royal Society, and after our few years of uh, priority program, we arrived at, at this new figure, so relative uh, convergence to the bottom left corner, so less affordable, less effective, more risky, and we didn't find any single method that uh, is more affordable, less risky, and so on. So this is the uh, general move to the more reddish left color bot bottom corner of the figure. Our conclusions, uh, well, the closer we look, the smaller the potential, the larger the side effects, and that's what we find for all methods we looked at. 
Green methods may not be so green, so they uh, have substantial governance issues as well. That's, I think if they should have an impact on the climate system, they have to be large, and if they are large, they have many side effects and many problems, very similar maybe to SRM. And that's why it is, I think, very good to have everything in a joint project and don't separate SRM and CDR. Our current problems and questions, how do we define a quantified report uncertainties, which will be very well, central for risk assessment, public acceptance, decision making, liability, identification, regulation of damage, policy and governance, of course, which all involves uncertainties and has to be deal with uncertainties, has to deal with it. And uh, beyond that, well, useful assessment metrics. We use temperature, CO2, and so on, rainfall, but is this really relevant for the governance issues that society will be in, have to know, be aware of to arrive at useful and informed decisions? Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Andreas. And next up, we have Phil Williamson, who works for the Natural Environment Research Council and is based at the University of East Anglia. Uh, he's also the science coordinator of the UK Greenhouse Gas Removal Research Program, which he'll be introducing us to. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's good to be here. And uh, five minutes on UK program. And as you'll see at the bottom there, quite a few logos because there are quite a few funders. And that's, let's see if I can get the, that's the, one of the key features of our greenhouse gas removal program is that it's jointly funded by three UK research councils and one government department. So it's focused on delivering science for policy needs. That's pretty important. It's also a greenhouse gas removal program. We've had introductions about CO2, but I think I want to emphasize that it isn't just that climate change isn't a CO2 problem, and although most of the effort has been directed at CO2 and will continue to be directed at carbon removal, we really do need to keep the bigger picture there and to know what other greenhouse gases are doing as well, so that's why it's part of our title. So we're not funding very much in the way of other greenhouse gases, but they are an important component. And thirdly, we didn't, although we planned the program, started about five years ago, didn't really get the impetus and didn't get going until after Paris and then the realization, the national realization uh, that, uh, and it was mentioned by, by Ben just 20 minutes ago, half an hour ago, that if, we, if we're going to re rely on SRM, then we need to know whether it works. Well, if we're going to rely on CDR, we're going to know, we need to know whether it's going to work. And we've seen versions of this graph already but showing that within the uh, integrated assessment models that we've got at present, uh, that they do rely on having greenhouse gas removal, CDR removal, starting pretty soon, 2030s, not so long away. Uh, they've got to get going then, and they've got to buy around 2070 or so, actually to have as much going in as going out. And that's part of the, of the Paris Agreement. So in order to, to balance the budget, uh, what, what's envisaged is that we need to have pretty large-scale CDR happening in the pretty near future. Uh, and we've had discussions and mentioned we had an excellent overview earlier from them on the different ways of doing CDR, GGR, and here's just a, a, a graphical representation. Some of them uh, 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 biological capture, some geochemical capture, some physicochemical. There are other variations, there are other possibilities, but those are just a, a, a very quick graphic and a summary of what's, what was in scope to begin with for the UK programme, saying these are the, the techniques, the approaches that we want to look at. And what we want to look at is their effectiveness, their scalability, unintended impacts, socioeconomic consequences, and full life cycle analysis. So will they work? What are, what are the extra consequences and impacts? Uh, and as I've mentioned right at the start, by having the different research councils, it is an interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary exercise to find out from all different approaches uh, whether it's going to be feasible uh, and, and, and what, uh, to what extent uh, it, we ought to continue to include it within the, uh, the climate change models. Uh, the details of the program, can't go into much detail, uh, just have a, a few headlines there. Some of the, these are the main consortia uh, that, that, that we're funding through the program. You can have a look at the words there. Most of them are self-explanatory but maybe the one in yellow, number three, that's another way of saying enhanced weathering. Uh, those names there and, and the institutions are the lead institutions, 
Uh, these are the, the consortia projects, so there's lots of other uh, linked projects and linked the, the part of a team involved in there, and they also have extra partners who are not necessarily academics involved in those major studies. But in addition to those four major consortia programs, we also have uh, some smaller projects, more focused, looking at specific topics. Again, glance down at the titles there, and you'll see the sort of work that is being supported. Some of it is overview, some of it is, is, is focused on particular techniques. And the way that those techniques and consortia map onto the uh, initial diagram that I had, you can have a look at it there. So we're not covering everything, there's still a lot more to do. Add up all the funding, and it's around 8.6 million pounds, roughly equivalent to eight or nine million euros, eight or nine million uh, US dollars. So it's, it's, it's uh, a reasonable amount of money, but it, we, we consider it's not enough, and there's plenty of scope for additional work to fill in some of the gaps. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. And with that, we come to our last speaker for this plenary, uh, which is Andy Parker, who is the project director of the Solar Radiation Management Governance Initiative, which he'll introduce us to now. I will. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you all. Um, yes, so the Solar Radiation Management Governance Initiative, SRMGI, it's an international NGO-driven project um, for expanding the conversation around the governance of SRM research, particularly to developing countries and emerging economies, uh, for the simple reason that is it is that it generally matters more to them. They're on the front lines of climate change. SRMGI was launched in 2010 by the Royal Society, by TWAS, the World Academy of Sciences, and by Environmental Defence Fund. And our main stock in trade, our main stock in trade for the last uh, six or seven years has been running engagement workshops across uh, the developing world, always run in concert with local partner organisations. The goal is always the same, to start a conversation, to get people thinking about SRM uh, and to think about what they would like to happen next in their countries. We've run uh, 16 workshops across 13 different uh, countries in the global south. And this week, with the help of the IASS and CEC 17, we have brought back together 40 of our very finest participants, uh, where they will uh, do two things. One, they're going to attend the SRMGI Global Forum. The first day took place yesterday. The second day is on Friday. Their objective there is to simply address the question, what next for engagement with SRM in their home countries? Um, secondly, they're attending this, they're attending CEC 17. Um, in fact, SRMGI participants, would you mind raising your hands and just waving to the people so you can see them? There's, there's 40 of them. Um, you can recognize them on our, on our badges. We have the SRMGI logo at the bottom. Uh, go and talk to them. They're here to learn, to share, to teach, to chair sessions, to take part, to present posters. Uh, so do go and talk to them. Um, so that's the present of SRMGI. The future is exciting. Yesterday, we announced a major expansion of our work from 2018 through 2020. Uh, this is thanks to a large grant from our funders, the Open Philanthropy Project. And the grant will allow us to do two things. Uh, one, we will be able to expand our program of engagement meetings across the global south. There are still many, many countries we want to visit, bring more people into the discussion, hopefully hold another uh, SRMGI Global Forum in due course. Secondly, we are uh, launching a new dimension to our work. We're going to be setting up a research fund, uh, which is called Decimals. I'm going to have to read this because I can never remember what Decimals stands for. My paper says it stands for Developing Country Impact Modeling Analysis for SRM, Decimals. And this is an idea that's repeatedly proposed in our meetings around the world. It's consistently supported by our participants, whether or not they like the idea of SRM. To, to paraphrase one of our uh, Kenyan participants in the Nairobi workshop, uh, he said something like, well, SRM's clearly a ridiculous idea, it's clearly stupid, but we've got to understand it. We've got to know if it's not going to work, as we heard this morning, if it's not going to work, then we need to know now. So, yes, starting in 2018, we will be providing grants for developing country scientists who want to analyse the SRM impacts that matter most to them locally. That might be hurricanes in the Caribbean, might be flooding in Bangladesh, it will depend on the proposals. Uh, and decimals will be administered by TWAS, the World Academy of Sciences. They already are masters in this area. They give out dozens of grants per year to support developing country science, and they will administer decimals. Um, 
there will be a call for proposals in the next couple of months. We expect to give out four to seven grants to developing country scientists, and the grants will run over a two to three year period. And to do the maths on your behalf, that means when we come back here, all of us in this room for CEC 20, we will be joined by a cohort of developing country scientists who are able to talk with some authority about the projected impacts that SRM may have on their regions. Um, decimals is not just about producing high quality science, that's not the only point. Uh, there will be money available for our grantees to be able to run their own outreach meetings towards the end of their research projects, uh, reporting on their findings to their local climate communities, starting conversations about the regional impacts of SRM that wouldn't otherwise have happened. We'll also provide uh, funding for that for a meeting next summer to bring all of our researchers together um, to have a meeting to discuss how they are going to address their research projects, how they're going to work with their colleagues in the north to create more of a community around this. And so, as a final call, I will ask for your help. If we get more good applications than we can give out grants, we're going to need more money. So if you've come to Berlin with 100,000 spare euros, come and see me afterwards. Um, we need contacts for our workshops, contacts in developing countries. They are only as strong as our partnerships with local organisations. If you have a suggestion for an organisation we can work with, um, then please come and see me. Um, ideas for how to inc increase the impacts of our work, and that starts with talking to all of our participants who are in the room today. Uh, Stefan is lurching towards me from the left side of the stage. I I presume I've gone on too long, so I will thank you for indulging me and bid you a good morning. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, all the speakers, and uh, thank you all very much. I've taken us slightly into the break. Uh, we're about 10 minutes into the break now. Uh, please do be on time for the sessions that start at 11. Thank you all very much.